Yeah, I, I initially, obviously, I think I had certainly hoped to be giving this talk under uh, different circumstances, uh, a little bit more hopeful, but uh, as I said earlier in the SPA focus group session, uh, it's just that with the, the selection of Moonrise or SPA sample return has been delayed for a few years, and we'll get there eventually. Today I'm going to talk uh, about two aspects of the South Pole Lake and Basin, and again, all with the focus of what's in the regolith uh, and what survived there, um, and eventually... Maybe I'll talk about why we think that there's melt on the floor still. Um, but uh, I'm going to start by showing some of the M-cubed data for SPA and the diversity of materials that are seen there, segueing into uh, the impact crater record inside SPA and what those craters are excavating, exposing, and essentially distributing into the regolith at the surface to be eventually sampled. So um, all with the goal of hopefully um, suggesting at least that the material at the surface would contain a, a significant abundance of SPA-derived impact melt. Um, so looking at the m cube data, now on the, on the left is a simple albedo mosaic of several data strips. You can see the, the individual strips that have been stitched together uh, there. And I also, actually, just before I go on further, all of the, S, all of the m cube data are available in the PDS. We have our final delivery later this year of uh, our level two data products. So on the, on the right-hand side, sorry, on the left-hand side, uh, it is a mosaic of the interior of SPA. This is a portion of the Apollo Basin. Uh, the 180-degree longitude line runs approximately down the middle of the image. Um, we've got the uh, Ingenai Basin here, uh, and several of, the several of the large craters are, are located in the middle of the image that I'll be talking about uh, over the course of the talk. On the right-hand side of the slide is a, a color composite that illustrates some of the compositional variability that m cubed is seeing. Um, I won't get into too much detail how, of how this image was generated, but it's, it's, it's striking in, in what it shows. The um, red channel is a map of the um, band, integrated band depth, the one micron absorption feature seen in MAFIC uh, minerals. The, the green band is the, uh, the integrated band depth for the two micron uh, absorption feature. And the blue is albedo, reflectance. And so what we're seeing here in, in um, and I just totally ruined it. What we're seeing here is a blank screen. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. So what we see here uh, in the, the greens, obviously, are some of the, the Mare basalts uh, scattered across the interior of Apollo and Janai. Uh, the, the light greens, sort of teal colors, are some of the more crystalline neuritic material, low calcium pyroxenes uh, that are found in some central peaks. That'll be important uh, later on. Uh, the reds. Not the baseball team, but the red colors here are uh, indicative of, of a more of a higher calcium pyroxene signature that may be uh, a gabbro or some other kind of pyroxene that's exposed at the surface. And then the blues interior to the basin, and then the color stretch doesn't show it so well. There's a sort of generally neuritic signature across much of the basin that's relatively homogeneous. And, and what we feel is that that represents a relatively homogenized uh, remnant of the SPA melt sheet. Uh, there are again some of these. Unique colors, or the, the red colors, are maybe indicative of, of a slightly different composition, possibly reflecting um, differences in, in the original crust that were uh, melted. But overall, there's this general neuritic signature across much of the basin. And then in some few areas, the interior of Apollo and south of the Alder Crater here, there are areas that are more, um, or actually less mafic, uh, possibly a little more plagioclase rich. In there. So what, what M-cubed is, is seeing here is that there's a, there's a wide diversity of materials, but in general, much of the floor of SPA is contain, it contains this neuritic material that, uh, again, we're interpreting to reflect the, the composition of the SPA melt sheet. But, of course, one of the, the great concerns is, well, how much it, of the melt is remnant on the floor? Clearly, there's some component of it, but we want to know exactly how, or we want to be able to convince ourselves that there's going to be enough that would uh, would be sufficient in sampling. Okay, so moving on. Um, I mentioned the, the, the crystalline neuritic um, central peaks in several craters in work done by the m cube team as well as the spectral profile profiler on Kaguya saw in four central peaks these beautiful crystalline neuritic materials um, that either reflect very deep portions of the impact melt or possibly uh, sub SPA melt material, basement material. Uh, these four craters are scattered across the interior of the basin. I'm going to focus on the ones right in the middle, in particular, Baba Crater right in here. 
Again, all of these show a, low, a, a lower wavelength one micron absorption feature indicative of neuritic materials. Um, we're going to use these central peaks to help constrain what the uh, craters are excavating and distributing across the surface. And it was at, at the NLSI last year, a talk by David Kring, that really sort of resonated with me of what I'm trying to describe here. In last year's talk, Dave uh, talked about how small craters, and in particular uh, the north and south ray craters at Apollo 16, did not efficiently reset the age of the target material, that they didn't essentially reset the, uh, the, the, the ages of what they were impacting into. And so it was that sort of that got my mind racing and thinking, well, what, how can this be to used to our advantage trying to figure out what's inside SPA? Okay, so for example, we're looking at Baba Crater here, which is the one that has that beautiful crystalline neuritic central peak. Here's an, an L-Rock slew uh, uh, oblique image showing the beautiful central peak structure. Um, using uh, crater scaling developed by Sintal and Grieve in 98, it can constrain what may have been excavated and exposed in the impact process. So for a 64 kilometer diameter crater, um, it's going to excavate down to about six and a half kilometers. The central peak is going to come from below the, the deepest portion of, of melting from about 10 and a half kilometers. Um, and then using some derived uh, relationships, uh, this F melt, fraction of melt that's ejected out of the crater, uh, and I'll explain how that number is derived in a moment, that in fact for even a crater this size that the fraction of melt generated by a crater uh, by a baba is relatively low, three and a half, four percent would be sampled outside. And, and for example, if you're one transient crater radii away, it'd be about seven meters of material there. That's derived from a, a scaling equation by Facet et al. that's um, uh, about to be published. And so what we see for a crater, even as big or as small, depending on how you're thinking about it, it's not actually distributing and ejecting a lot of its own impact mode. It's going to be redistributing the target material. And we would contend that, contend that that target material is mostly SPA impact melt. And so for a number of craters, and this is just an example uh, of the craters that uh, I looked at, um, you know, the fraction of melt is all relatively small, even up to the, the largest crater in the interior of Leibniz. Only about 8% of, it of its ejected would be uh, its own impact melt. Most of the ejected there would be retained. So using the scaling equations, and, and again, the, the central peaks, we can begin to place, or uh, at least constrain, the thickness of, of a possible uh, melt sheet within the center of, of SPA. So um, again, we have those four craters. They range in size from 64 to 143 kilometers in diameter. The maximum depth of melting for those craters, or the depth of origin for the central peaks, ranges from 10 to 34 kilometers. If we assume that that smallest size, 10 kilometer di uh, uh, depth for a central peak, uh, sort of constrains the thickness of an impact melt, that the material exposed in those central peaks is coming from below the impact melt. Uh, we, and again, assuming, when we all know the danger of what happens when you assume something, uh, that if we assume those craters expose material from below the melt, we can assume that there's about 10 kilometer thick of melt on the floor of SPA, at least in the center portion around, uh, around the Baba crater. Um, of course, we do have to keep in mind and consider the possibility of how much cryptomari is, is on top of, of a possible melt sheet, as Jim talked about yesterday. Uh, still, that's constraining you know, about 10, maybe 12 kilometers of material, and certainly efficient and, uh, or not, uh, uh, certainly enough material that could be uh, redistributed by any of these craters. So what does it apply for all of these small craters in the interior of SPA? What are they redistributing? Okay, so looking at a, a, a plot comparing two different parameters, one being the fraction of melt and ejected, that F melt parameter that was derived by, uh, described by Barb in an abstract a couple of years ago, and comparing that to, let me read my axis here, the depth of excavation of material, so the maximum depth of material that's excavated in ejecta, you can see that for, again, for very small craters, smaller than, uh, with a transient, transient cavity diameter smaller than 100 kilometers, you're gonna be excavating a very small amount of sort of new melt material, less than about 6%. Um, at the same time, that material is going to be derived from uh, the upper 20, 30 kilometers uh, of, the, of the crust. So looking at some of the, the basins that are inside of, uh, of SPA, and two particularly relevant ones, the Apollo Basin, 
which is the sort of the nearest large basin to some of those areas I was look, uh, talking about, with a transient cavity diameter of about 300 kilometers. And of course, Schrodinger Basin, which is the second youngest basin on the moon, with a slightly smaller, although still a significant transient cavity, a little over 200 kilometers in diameter. Those, those craters are excavating you know, fairly deeply, uh, up into about 40 kilometers depth. But again, the fraction of melt that they're ejecting is relatively is, is relatively small, 10 to 12 percent of their of their ejecta is going to be um, uh, their own melt. So while these large craters are going to be introducing some of their own material, again, it's the sort of the reworking by the smaller craters that are going to be bringing up the deeper or the material that's in it's part of the SPA melt sheet and redistributing that around the surface. So these small craters are really our friends in that they're resupplying the material to the surface, the, S the melt material, the SPA melt material to the surface, in a sense masking and, 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 and hiding or at least uh, diluting some of these other uh, melt fractions. So implications for smaller craters in SP within SPA is that they're excavating and redistributing mostly the target material, SPA melt, uh, from depths about less than six kilometers and that these small craters are again refreshing the surface. They're redistributing melt, SPA melt material back onto the surface. And again, remember the M cubed data, which shows that in general, most of the uh, floor of the F SPA is relatively homogeneous in that, that that the material is sort of bringing back up this neuritic component. Uh, some of the larger craters, and there are a few, are going to be excavating both melt material and maybe basement material from from greater depths. Um, and then that material may reflect lower crust or upper mantle. And then that central craters in SPA um, are going to be um, uh, uh, incorporating, again, this, this lower material. Um, and, and again, some, it's going to be, they'll be introducing their own melt while still introducing the SPA component. And then I have some conclusions up here. I won't read through all of them, but that I think that in thinking about how small craters are, are friends in helping out the cause of, again, keeping SPA melt at the surface or whatever the basement might actually be. Um, and that a lot of work still has to be done in assessing what's actually in the interior. Um, but material is going to be there waiting for us to go sample. So thank you. We have time for a couple questions. Well, I have one. How, how, you know, things like the Apollo Basin mm -hmm. are going to produce their own melt. Right. So how, how do you, you know, the question is going to be how do you sort out some other impact melt from SPA melt from melt from someplace else that was even older? Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the $400 million question, I suppose. And I think that the, some of the work that Barb has done in looking at sort of the statistical probability, assuming that these are going to be a diversity of ages, what the work that I, I've started doing here is showing that if the floor of SPA is dominated by SPA melt, that, that peak of material, that there's going to be an age that reflects SPA that will be the primary component. That you may be sampling an age or getting material from Apollo. That age will appear, but will not essentially uh, dominate the signal of ages. And so with a, you know, with a, a significant amount of material that, you're, that will be sampled in age dated, uh, should be able to derive ages for other events of course, tying what event, you know, what's Apollo versus some other large nearby basin will be will be tricky. But uh, again, looking at areas that are dominated by SPA melt, we expect that those ages.